Hey, it's great to be with you today, Nations Church, whether you're joining online or in the room today. It's, uh, it's a privilege that we can meet together as family, right? And so please don't take uh, the fact that we can come and meet together as the body of Christ lightly. It's such a beautiful thing that we can do in, in our expression of our love towards God and our love towards people. And so I'm really excited to be able to share the Word of God with you today. I believe the Word of God is powerful, it is inspired, and it's the only thing that can truly transform us, right? As man's words can do no transforming power in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds, but the Word of God is powerful. And so as we come around the Word of God today, I just pray that it would bless you, uh, and whether you're sitting in your lounge room in your dressing gown or something like that, or whether you're sitting in church today in a dressing gown too for some reason, uh, I just pray that this word would, would bless you and the Holy Spirit uh, would come alongside you and would sit with you today and speak to you uh, about the passages that we're going to look through. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, this is a word that I kind of wrestled with. Uh, it wasn't a sermon that I particularly wanted to deliver today. Uh, it's one that I was, I was going through a bit of a season where the Holy Spirit was sort of leading me to uh, cutting off a lot of noise and voices and things in my life and, and sort of just positioning myself in lots of times of silence, which I, I kind of felt a little bit uncomfortable with, if I'm honest. It's like turning off all the podcasts, turning off the TV, switching off to all social media and electronic devices, and it's just like, oh my gosh. This is weird. <laughs> it's like the olden times. <laughs> I feel like I'm Amish. Anyway, uh, I sort of went through a bit of a season where I was stripping back some of those things. And I, it was actually really beautiful because it would happen literally every night. God would just wake me up in the middle of the night and just begin to speak to me about things. And I was really annoyed because like, I need my sleep. And I'm a very bad Christian and person when I don't get my sleep. Uh, but it was actually beautiful in terms of what he spoke to me about. And, and this word was literally uh, uh, dropped into my spirit when God woke me up in the middle of the night and just began to just speak these things to me and so I wrote them down and, and, I went and, and I went and studied and searched through scripture and so today if you got any issues with what I'm preaching blame the Holy Spirit <laughs> for saying it to me and you can send all complaints to God uh, rather than me if you disagree with any points. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, already writing down that email, holyspirit at gmail.com, let's go. <laughs> Uh, this, this word, and as, as I, I guess I do my role with the college here at Nations Church, uh, one of the things I love about it is to dive into the scriptures and to dive into God's word. And what you'll find if you actually read through the Bible is that at times it can be like a book full of tensions, right? It can be a book full of tensions between two very real truths. It could be one truth on one side and another on the other side, and they're both true but they're sitting at seemingly contradictory ends on this sort of pendulum swing between these two very true tensions. And I think the, uh, I guess the thing for us as believers or the temptation for us as believers is to swing to the extremes of these truths, to swing to these pendulum extremes where we sit so very far end on that truth, so much so that we actually deny and we negate the very real truth on the other side. And we can see that all throughout Scripture, and in particular, there's a few that I, I want to look at today, but we need to recognize, I think, as believers that even though it might be a truth represented to us in Scripture, we don't want to be unbalanced. We don't want to be so swung on one pendulum side to an extreme, so much so that we negate the very real truth on the other side. As believers, we need to be balanced. We need to be centered in the truth of God, in the truth of the nature and the character of who he is and why. Because really, if we have an unbalanced understanding of the goodness and the nature and the character of God, what does that affect? It affects our understanding. We then have an unbalanced understanding of who we are and how we live our life and how the world is meant to be. And we go through seasons where we seem to struggle and we, we're disappointed and there's frustrations. Why? Because we're living unbalanced. We're not living in the pure truth. We're living in an extreme truth. And one of these, I guess, tensions that I've, I've found throughout Scripture, and it's so prevalent throughout all of Scripture, is the tension between the now and the not yet. The now and the not yet. Now, this now and not yet understanding, it's so clearly depicted to us through all of the New Testament Scripture. Jesus teaches at length about this. Paul goes into great detail to try and unpack this. Pretty much every single New Testament writing will talk about this tension between the now and not yet. Paul gives us these ideas like, we're redeemed, but we're not yet redeemed. <laughs> you know, we're sanctified, but we're not yet sanctified. We're raised through, with Christ, but we're not yet raised with Christ. It's a bit confusing, right? So what are you guys on about? <laughs> like, speak English, please. Or Greek at the time. Anyway, uh, we've got all these things. That, that wasn't that funny. <laughs> like, college jokes. 
We've got all these things that are presented to us that are almost tension points. And this idea of the now and not yet can be so incredibly strange to us. But what it simply means is this. So we live in a broken world and the world was in a broken, sinful state. But God looked upon it with the eyes of love, so much so that he sent his son to pay a price that was rightfully mine to pay, that was rightfully yours to pay, that was rightfully ours to pay. He sent his son to be this beautiful sacrificial lamb so that we could know salvation, so that we could know what the love of the father truly looked like. And then the perfect thing for us is after that salvation moment, everything's perfect in life. There's no more pain. There's no more issues. The world is perfect. It's puppies, sunshine, rainbows, all of these things. Not quite, right? Not quite. We know the beautiful picture of salvation, which is truly a not yet reality breaking into the very present now. And we can experience the not yet through this picture of salvation. We see heaven breaking through into our now situation. And we see that every day. We see it every day where we might see miracles, we see breakthrough, we see healings. All of these things, answered prayers, they're all the not yet realities and perfection breaking through to our present. And it's actually a beautiful picture, right? This understanding of what Christ's salvation actually accomplished for us was to be able to see the not yet break into the present, to see the not yet break into our now state. And it does sound beautiful and it does sound like ridiculously good. But at the same time, it's actually a really difficult concept for us to grapple with. Because even though we see the not yet break into our now, the reality is that we still live in the now. We still live in a broken, sinful, fallen world. We still live in a world that is full of pain. We still live in a world that is full of waiting. We still live in a world that is full of hurt. And we're left with this position as believers where we experience the brutalities, the trials, the pain, the realities of living in a broken world. And sometimes we don't see the not yet break into our present moment. And sometimes we don't yet see the perfection of the not yet break into exactly where we are. And that's a position that we've all been at as believers in life, right? Where we've been sitting in a moment of despair or a moment of hurt or a moment of pain. Where we've been sitting in the now season and we say things like, God, why didn't that person get healed? Because we did the right things. We stood in faith. We declared. We believed God. We stood on your word, but they didn't get healed. Is it something that I've done done wrong? Did did they have hidden sin? Were they doing the wrong things? And those lines of thoughts are so wrong and not biblically based at all. And we think and we ask ourselves these questions. We're like, God, why? Why is your not yet not breaking into this situation? And we say things like, God, why do I still struggle with this sin area? Why is this something that I'm just carrying? I'm trying to yield to you, Holy Spirit. I feel like I'm doing X, Y, Z, all of these things so that I don't struggle with this thing anymore. But why am I still walking with a limp? And we say things like, God, why aren't I getting breakthrough? In this area, I'm being faithful. I feel like I'm I'm submitting to you, Lord, but why is this not coming to pass? And you can see the tension for us as believers, right? How do we reconcile the fact that we can experience the goodness of the not yet, of the new heavens and you are breaking into moments of here now, but also recognize that we exist in a tension between the now and the not yet? We don't exist in the full perfection of the not yet. Right? We don't exist in the new heavens and new earth. That hasn't come to pass yet. We exist in the tension between the now and the not yet. And it's such a, such a difficult thing for us, I think, as believers. And what can happen is we just do these pendulum swings to extremes. We go far too end to one not yet extreme. And then we're expecting the perfection in the now. And we're expecting those things. Or we can swing to the other extent and just think, oh, it's just complacent in the now. And we do this with so many areas in our life. And there's two particular areas that I want to look at today. But I just love the Apostle Paul. And he is someone who has an eternal mindset. And when you read his work, you see that. He is someone who understands the tension between the now and not yet in his life. And I want to turn to a passage today and look at what what he begins to share with. And he's speaking to the church in Philippi and he's writing them a letter. He's actually at the end of his letter and he's just thanking them about sending him financial support. But he says something just so powerful and we can gloss over it. And at times we actually even take it way out of context. But let's look at this passage, Philippians 4.10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
I have learned the secret. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And this passage, as long as we just take the last bit, because that sounds good. That's like, beautiful, yeah, awesome. Stick that on the back of the toilet door. And it's just like, yeah, I can believe for that. The other stuff sounds a bit, mm, not so good, right? And we take that and, you know, athletes ride it and they ride it on their, their clothes and we say it before about to do something difficult. But to diminish this passage is actually to do such a disservice to what Paul's saying. Yeah. To diminish this passage and distill it down to just, you know, I can do anything in my life, not only takes it out of context, but actually it just does a discredit to Paul's message here. He says, and he writes to the church in Philippi, but understand the time in Paul's life. He's actually in prison when he writes this. It's later on in Paul's ministry. It's later on in his earthly life. It's not going to be long before Paul is executed. And he writes to the church in Philippi, and he says, I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be what? Content. I am to be content. Now, that word content is an interesting one. Now, in the Greek, it actually means outer case, which literally just means not being in need, being self-sufficient, not being beholden to circumstances going your way. Greek philosophers actually used this word of being content. And the picture that they would get across was that things could not go your way in life, but you would still be fine. You were detached from the desired outcome. You didn't need the desired outcome to be fine. Greek philosophers would use this word. And Paul uses this. And he says that whatever challenge I face in life, whatever I go through, need or plenty, low or abundance, I am to be what? I am to be content. I am to be content. Not by his own strength, though. Through whose strength? Christ. Christ who strengthens him. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as believers is, do we have that same perspective as Paul? Do we have that same understanding as Paul? That in any circumstance, in any situation, whatever life in this tension between the now and the not yet will bring, are we content through Christ who strengthens us? Or do we have our pendulum swing moments where we swing to one extreme and we think, well, only if I get these blessings that are, my heart is after, the desires of my heart, then I'll be content. Or do we swing the other way to this now understanding, living in complacency, not realizing that what Christ actually did was to be paving a way for the not yet to break into the now? And one of the areas I think that can really harm us in our life if we have an unbalanced perspective and we swing too far one way on the pendulum with this is the areas of sin and holiness. Sin and holiness. Now, it's, it's quite crazy to me that we have this fact that we can live holy lives but still struggle with sin <laughs> it's like mind-boggling to me we know that we can live holy lives we're capable of great good all right through Christ but we're also capable of great let's say maybe less than good <laughs> because we don't want to make ourselves feel bad and it's Sunday morning 11 a.m we've already had a sleep and let's, let's let's not let's not make it worse we're capable of living holy lives but we still live in a life where we struggle with the realities of our own sin of others' sin, and just the sin of the world as a whole. It's such a difficult one to grapple with. And so what we often do is we find ourselves being on this pendulum and we swing to these two extremes of either this not yet picture of holiness and perfection or this now picture of just being complacent in sin the way things are. And so I often look at so many times in my life where I've swung so far to the holiness perspective. And what I've done when I've swung so far to expecting holiness is I've put unreasonable expectations on my current state, not realizing that I live between a tension of a now and a not yet. Perfection and holiness is the not yet, the beautiful picture of God's full restoration coming to pass. But I don't live in that state just yet. I live in an in-between of the not yet breaking into the now. And when you expect and you are all after and desiring and striving for perfection, what you do is you put unreasonable expectations on yourself and on others. And I've sat in seasons of my life where I've been expecting perfection of myself, where I've been expecting holiness to the extreme of myself. And then when I make a mistake inevitably, or I sin, or I do something that I should have done, and sin is literally just anything that is not God's intended purpose for your life, right? And when I make a mistake or I do these things, I look at myself and I think, who on earth are you? What is wrong with you? How could you? How could you? 
because I'm setting unreasonable expectations for myself and I can't forgive myself. But I think the most damaging area that this holiness perspective pendulum swing can have on us is in our relationship with others. And I've looked at seasons where I really struggled with unforgiveness in my heart and in my life. And if I was honest, I struggled with it because I expected perfection from people. I expected holiness. And so when someone wronged me or did the wrong thing, as wrong as the actions were, I couldn't forgive because I'd shut off my forgiveness because I expected something that was unrealistic. It was a not yet reality, right? But we're not in that. And so I would look at people and someone would do the wrong thing to me and I would just really struggle and, and, and couldn't forgive and struggle to and was striving to be able to. And in a season where I was struggling with this, God literally woke me up in the middle of the night and said, Richard, and by the way, I'm getting annoyed at God may wake me up in the middle of the night. I need my sleep. I'm tired. But he just keeps doing it. I feel like, you know, I'm just like, dude, I'm not Samuel. Stop waking me up in the middle of the night. Give me a break. <laughs> Wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, Richard, Richard. Richard, don't hold yourself and loved ones to an unreachable standard. Don't hold yourself and loved ones to a higher standard than I do. And that floored me. That floored me. (laughs) Don't hold yourself and loved ones to a higher standard than I, your heavenly Father, do. (sighs) So the question is for us, are we sitting on that extreme? When someone wrongs us, as wrong as those things were, do we look at people through the eyes of the Father, the way He sees them? Or are we looking through them expecting perfection? Do we look at our kids and expect perfection from them? Do we look at our spouse and when they wrong us, it's just like, how could you do that? I expected this from you. That's just unreasonable. That's a not yet. But we can swing the other way, right? And on the flip side, the pendulum swings right over. All right, well, then we'll just sit in sin. All right, well, holiness didn't work for me. I'll just sit in the mud over here and sin. And I'll be complacent with the fact that this is just always the way I'm going to be. This is just my lot. This is my struggle. This is just who I am. What a lie. You are not your sin. You are not your mistakes. You are not the wrong things you have done. You are a son and a daughter of God. And we can sit on this full-on pendulum swing the other way thinking, oh, This is just who I am. And we sit in complacency. And I look at seasons of my life where, if I'm honest, I stopped trying to deal with sin issues that I had in my life. And I just gave up and thought, that's just who I am. That's just how I struggle. But what a lie of the enemy. What a lie of the enemy. See, what Christ did, and we think about our sin issues, but what he did is he came and paid the price, but he enabled us to see the not yet break into our now situation. And these two extremes, when you go to them, whilst there's elements of truth there, the extremes does not leave you with truth. Both ends are so hurtful. Both ends are so detrimental to us and our relationships with others. One sits in the sin that we're in before salvation. And the other sits in condemnation and shame. But when we return to the middle, I've got to tell you, the middle's beautiful. It's literally the purest and most beautiful depiction of the goodness and kindness and grace of God. For what else could it be that we can sit in a state where he could look at us at our most vilest, where he could look at us at our most sinful, yet still recognize that we are forgiven, yet still call us and save us, but not just leave it at salvation, but no, say, I am calling you onto something more, something greater, reflecting my image. It's this beautiful depiction that is only found when we're balanced in the middle. Not floating off on one extreme to the other extreme, but found balanced in our understanding of God. The other area that we can live between two tension points in our life, I think, is is breakthrough. Now, breakthrough, we know God is a God of the breakthrough. He is in pretty much every single way. It makes up who He is. One side of this pendulum swing, though, leads us to believe that God will provide the breakthrough in every single situation. That we, this is one sort of end final pendulum swing, that in every circumstance we'll get what we desire. We'll get exactly what we want. The other pendulum swings, swings so far over, over to this idea of sovereignty, so far past that to a point where we stop believing that God can even act in our present. And we stop believing that God can actually do things and break through into our present situation. And both of these pendulum swings are so hurtful. And so detrimental to us as believers. 
If we swing far to one extreme, we're so dissatisfied when all of a sudden there's divine delay. When all of a sudden that breakthrough doesn't come the way we expect it. When all of a sudden our needs and wants aren't met this side of eternity. And when we swing completely the other way, it's so detrimental because we stop believing. And we sit in disappointment. And we sit resigned to the fact that this is just the way it's going to be. And so often I think we go back and forth, almost like a bit of a yo-yo, right? And I look at uh, maybe the past few years of my life. And I've spent too much time sitting on this pendulum swing. And it's just like, God, I feel like you've said this to me. You've promised this to me. You've spoken this to me. Other people are confirming it in words. And and I'm believing for it. And then year after year, it doesn't take place. And so I'm like, okay, what's going on here? I'm hanging out. I'm waiting, God. Like, you know, when you're ready kind of thing. And maybe you can resonate online or today in the room. You can resonate on, and reflect on times where you felt like there's just a delay. And you, you say things that's just like, well, oh God, like, you know, you're frustrated and disappointed. You're like, well, you know, did, did, I, did I get it wrong? God, I know the plans that you have for me. And we cite that, but kind of sometimes what we really mean is, I know the plans I have for me. I know my desires. I know the outcome that is so desirable for me that I want. And what we do is we attach our faith to the outcome. And we start worshipping blessings, the outcome, the healing, the miracle. We worship that. And what we do is we tether our faith to it. And if it doesn't take place and if it doesn't happen, what do we do? We're shaken. And where are we left to swing? We swing right back to the other side. And we land ourselves in a position of just like, well, I guess this is just how it's always going to be. This is it. This is my life. I live with this. This is what it looks like. And both of those positions are so unhelpful. Both of those positions lead us to really a place that is not what God has for us. But it's a sad reality that we can find ourselves going on this pendulum swing and we can swing so far to the point where we stop believing, that we stop living in faith and we stop declaring breakthrough and we stop praying and we stop thinking that God can actually break through in the present because we know that he can. Literally, we record testimonies. Why? 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 Because it builds faith, it builds encouragement that God can and does break through into our current situations. But at the same time, if we swing that pendulum the other way to where there's no pain, there's no hurt, there's no waiting, that's not our reality. That's the full and perfect perfection on the other side of eternity. And if we swing that far that way, we're so dissatisfied when things don't end up as we planned. And we're frustrated and we're hurt and we question God. And we question his goodness. And we question his character. When things don't go our way, when things don't happen, when we face hurt. And I don't say these things lightly. Because the reality of a broken world is that it's painful. Literally, it's so painful at times. And thank God for the goodness and grace and kindness he shows us that we can see the not yet break into our present. We could look across the seas and gaze into other countries and see pain going on there. But if we're honest, all we need to do is gaze across to the eyes of the person next to us to know that there's hurt in this world, to know that there's pain in this world, to know that this world doesn't reflect his good and perfect plan that will come to pass because we live in a tension between the now and the not yet. In the book of Daniel, we're presented with an account of three guys who are in Babylonian exile and they're in the courts of King Nebuchadnezzar. And because that's a bit of a clumsy word to use, we're just going to call him King Neb, Neb for short. And uh, we'll roll with that. And he doesn't care because he's dead. And so he doesn't mind. We'll call him King Neb. And he wasn't the nicest guy anyway, but I guess that's not good reasoning for it. But anyway, they won't bow down to the statues this guy sets up. He says, bow down to these gods. He even saw himself as a godlike figure as well. And this is their response. Daniel 3, 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned... Oh, I said I'd call him Neb. Okay, we'll do it the next time. All good. Keep me accountable to that. Summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Neb said to them... There we go. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, all of these awesome kinds of instruments, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Neb, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. 
And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. There's so much in this passage, in the surrounding chapters in the book of Daniel. But the thing that stands out for me here is that there is a faith in God. There is a faith in what God is able to do without a tethering of our faith to the outcome. Without a tethering of our faith to the desired outcome. Their faith is not in the desired outcome. The breakthrough in this circumstance, where is their faith? In God. Their faith is not tethered to the outcome. And when we reduce our faith down to being tethered to the outcome, to being beholden to the positive outcome, to getting what we want in that circumstance, and getting what we want, it's not a bad thing. We're believing for breakthrough. We're believing for healing. All these amazing things, right? It's not a bad thing. But if our faith is tethered to that, well, then what happens if that doesn't occur? Where's our faith then? We need to have our faith only tethered to God. And who he is. Only tethered to him. Because otherwise, why do we worship him? Do we worship him just because he blesses us? Do we worship him just because he can break through for us? Do we worship him just because he provides for us? Not that these aren't characteristics of God. He is that. In his loving kindness and his goodness and just his nature and who he is. But is it the reason why we worship him? Is it the reason why we serve him? And if that's the case, and it is, then our worship doesn't reflect Christian worship. Our worship reflects Canaanite worship from the Old Testament. And the Canaanites would worship like this. Storm God. This is my version of it, okay? I'm sure there were some other ancient practices involved. Storm God, give us rain so that our crops will be watered. And we've got provision for our family. And so that things happen the way we want. Other area of life, God. That's what they had. All these gods for different areas of life. Other area of life, God. Bless this part of my life. Why are they worshipping those gods? So that they get what they want. And so the question for us is, do we diminish God and do we distill him down to just another Canaanite deity? By just saying, God, we worship you, but only if we get this. Only if this comes to pass. Because I've got to tell you guys, if that's where our worship and why our worship is attached to God, in the trials and the struggles of this broken world, we'll waver. Our foundations won't be strong. And I'm not saying this is easy. I get it. My answer isn't satisfying to me because with every single part of me wishes that there wouldn't be pain and hurt in this world. Because I know that there are stories that surround your life that are so laced with pain. I know that there's been areas where you've looked for breakthrough. I know that there's been areas where you required healing. I know that there's been areas where you stood in faith. But that just can't be the object of our faith. God reveals himself to Abraham. He reveals himself to Abraham. Abraham, like many other people, worshipped many gods. He was just some random dude. He had nothing special about him. God calls him and he reveals himself to him. And the way God reveals himself to Abraham is as the one true God. Before Abraham knows that God is provider, before Abraham knows that God is a God of blessings, that he's a God of breakthrough, that he's a God that delivers, he knows him as the one true God. That is why we worship him. That's, it's because he just is. Well, I've got to tell you, when we find ourselves in the middle, not swinging to these two extremes, man, in the middle is so much beauty. Because what can happen in the middle is we can stand in faith and we can stand in boldness and we can declare and we should. We 100% should. We can never set, sit in a position where we just give up where we just think God can't break into the present. But what we can't do is have the outcome tethered to our faith. Yeah, right. i got to tell you, that takes a lot of faith, guys. Yeah. And we sing this song before, I know breakthrough's coming. By faith, I see a miracle. And with this sort of bit of a happy, clappy kind of song, right? Happy vibes attached to it. But for some of us here today, online, those are some of the toughest words that you could yeah. even utter. Yeah. And maybe yeah. for some of you this morning, when you saw those words on that screen, you couldn't even bring your lips to saying them. Because you standing in faith looks like you standing in a position that regardless of the outcome being what you desire, you're still putting yourself in position saying, God, I have faith, I declare. I'm not tethered to the outcome, but God, I believe that you can. But even if you do not, I will never bow down to anything other than you, God. Even if you do not, you have my worship, you have my attention, you have my focus. That's faith. That's faith. 
That's a faith that endures and perseveres year after year, decade after decade of a breakthrough that doesn't come. That's faith of a husband and wife who journey through pain of maybe not being able to have children, children year after year, but still year after year they believe in faith. That's faith of somebody who's got maybe a sickness or something in their body where they require healing and they don't see it, but they still stand in faith and declare it. But even if it doesn't occur for them this side of eternity, they're not shaken. They're not shaken and they don't lead it into disappointment. That is true faith. It's the kind of faith I want to have. That when I experience the very real realities of the now and the brokenness of the world, I still stand in faith and declare the not yet into my present, but I'm not beholden to whether it comes to pass this side of eternity. That's the kind of faith that I believe Christ wants from his church, that I believe Christ wants from his bride. It's pure, it's authentic, and it understands our position between this tension and the now and not yet. If the band could just come up and join me. I want to end right back where we started. I spoke about Paul at the start and he's written this letter to the church in Philippi. And I said it's later on in his earthly life. It's later on in his missionary journeys, all of those things. It's later on in his ministry as a whole. And he writes this letter to the church in Philippi and he says what? In every situation, in every context, whatever I face, I am content through Christ. I'm content. I'm content. And so Paul's in prison. And not long after this, he's going to be executed by the Roman government. And just like every single apostle before and after him, bar one, he will pay the most gruesome and terrible punishment and torturous death for the thing that burnt so bright inside him. So passionate was he about what God was doing. So much faith that he had in the things and the reality of God that he just wanted to spread this good news wherever he went. But you don't even have to read that far around in some of Paul's other letters to know that he had other travel plans. To know that he had travel plans before the time where he was actually executed. He had plans where he felt called to cities where God was leading him to. He had plans where he was going to speak and preach and teach the good news into situations that needed it. He had plans and, and things that he was felt called to and that he wanted to do and that he endeavoured to do. And in this moment in his life, he's sitting in this prison. And you can't tell me that in this moment, Paul's not sitting there and declaring breakthrough. You can't tell me that he's not sitting in this moment and saying, God, I know you can deliver me from this. I know I'm feeling called to go and preach the gospel in this area, to deliver the good news to these people in this area, to go and do your work, God. I I feel called to do that. I've got my plans to go and do that. You can't tell me that he's not sitting there and declaring the breakthrough of the not yet in his present now situation. You can't tell me he's not. And so he's sitting there. You can't tell me his mind doesn't go back to the time where him and Silas, they just sit there. They just start singing songs about God. And then next minute, the chains break free. And so Paul's thinking, man, it's just like, this is easy. All I got to do is sing some songs. Let's just do that again. And then, but in this instance, Paul's breakthrough doesn't happen. Breakthrough doesn't come into this situation. And not long after he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, Paul's going to be executed. Not the desired outcome, not the answer to a breakthrough prayer, not the thing that he wanted. He had plans to go elsewhere, plans that he felt called to different areas, but it didn't come and it didn't happen. But I just know with all of me that regardless of the outcome, regardless of the situation that the Apostle Paul, even though there would have been moments of weakness, 100% he's human, but he would have been sitting there and I imagine the words that he wrote to the church in Philippi would have been ringing through his head. That in whatever situation I find myself in, whatever context I find myself in, that whatever the challenges of this life will bring, I am to be content through Christ who strengthens me. That he would have a response that echoes Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that says, you know what, my God can deliver me from this situation, but even if he does not, he has my worship. He has my attention. And friends, that's how we need to live. But it's not easy. Because I don't know the pain behind your story. I don't know the pain behind your situation, behind your area of need or breakthrough, behind your area where it seems like there's divine delay, behind your area where maybe you feel like God has tarried or you just feel like that is not going to be met. 
But what I know is that we're called to stand in faith. We're called to declare and we're not called to have our faith tethered to the desired outcome, to what we want. In this place, we're going to do something that we do at every single nation's church service. And so if you could all bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to allow a little bit of time for people to respond to the love and the saving grace of the Father. And this is something we do at every service. And what it is, is just a private moment between you and your heavenly Father. And it's a moment that myself and so many other people in this place have experienced ourselves. We've stood at a crossroad moment where we thought, you know what, is, is this God real? Is this Jesus guy that people keep banging on? Is he real? Is he legit? Is this love true? Is this love actually there? And let me tell you, friend, it is. I can't promise you an easy life. I can't promise you a life free of pain, free of hurt, free of trauma, free of the realities of this broken, sinful world. But what I can promise you is the most fulfilled life you will live as you walk every day, each new step into who He had always designed you to be, into the image and the goodness of God. And so right now in this place, if you've never accepted Jesus and Lord and Saviour over your life, all you've got to do is just do something very simple. There's nothing ritualistic about it. All it's doing is making a declaration right now before you and your Heavenly Father that Jesus is Lord and Saviour over your life, that you accept the grace and the kindness that the Father saw you as so worthy that He would send His Son to pay a price that was rightfully yours to pay and took the weight of sin, not just for you, but for the weight of sin for the whole world and washed you as white as snow. And so in this place with nobody looking around, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, all you need to do right now, if you want to respond to the love of the Heavenly Father and respond to that message, that good news of salvation and accept Jesus and the Lord and savor over your life, all you've got to do right now on the count of three is lift up your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Jesus, that's me. And so right now in this place, if that's you, all you've got to do is just raise your hand in three, two, one. Maybe the Holy Spirit speaking to you pressing this good news. It could be you online just sitting there in your lounge room. And you could be raising your hand in the comfort of your own home. And none of us will see you. But right now, God is speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. And right now, you're being brought to an awareness of the good news and the salvation of Christ. church I didn't see any hands in the room but it would be remiss of us not to repeat this prayer even if there was just the slimmest of chances that one person responded online so why don't you repeat this prayer after me dear heavenly father we thank you for sending your son to pay the price of my sin of our sin Jesus right now I declare you as Lord and Saviour over my life. Let me be forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. So good. Hey, why don't you all just stand to your feet in this place. As I was preparing the, this word, the Holy Spirit just began speaking to me about a few areas that I wanted to allow time for response. And I just love that when we wrestle with our faith and aspects of a faith as tricky and as difficult as they can be, but when we come to God and we submit ourselves before Him, I just know that He ministers to us. I just know that He meets us right where we're at. And maybe some of you guys today, you might fit into an area where you're just sitting in disappointment. You could be sitting and looking at some areas of your life and you've just sort of resigned yourself over to, this is just always how I am. This is what I struggle with. This is who I am. Friend, you are not your sin. You don't have to struggle with those areas and feel like they define who you are, but you can step each day into the grace of God and recognise that even though, even though we struggle, we can walk each day towards who He's made us to be. Or maybe that area of holiness and perfection is something that you've swung and you've realised as I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit's brought to mind with you that you've swung too far to that extent. And you hold yourself to a standard and you hold others to a standard that Christ and God do not even hold for us. Or maybe in this place, 
You've swung so far and it's probably as a counteraction. You didn't see breakthrough and so you just stopped believing completely. I actually felt the Holy Spirit really clearly say to me that there's people here and they literally stopped praying and they stopped believing. And there's no shame or condemnation. I feel you. I've done the same thing time after time. When we have these unmet expectations because we had unrealistic expectations that life would be free of pain and waiting. And so we swung the other way. But friend, please do not stop standing in faith. Don't have your faith tethered to the outcome. Don't have your faith beholden to things working out the way we desire. I wish it did. I wish it all worked out in perfection now. But friend, it doesn't. It just doesn't. That's the reality of the tension of the now and the not yet. And I even felt as I was preparing the sermon that there were people here and there's things that have happened in your life that are just so tragic and so painful. And even me speaking about these things without knowledge of them, I almost feel a bit bad to do that because I literally don't know the pain that you've gone through. And you might say, it could be easy for you to say, Richard, and it really is if I haven't experienced that moment. And I can only speak from a position of empathy and a position that says, I, I don't know the pain that you went through, but I feel like there's some people here this morning and you're holding unforgiveness against God. It might be online, it might be in the room today. But you look at what happened, the event that occurred was, was such a now event, which was such a broken, sinful event that was hurt, that relates to the state that we live in, this tension, and you think, God, where were you? Why didn't you? How could you not? How could you not? Man, and I share that pain with you. And I'm so sorry. It wasn't God's intention. It wasn't God's designs. It's just the harsh reality of our tension and the state we live in between the now and the not yet. And I don't promise or pretend to have all the answers with these stuff with these things and I don't pretend to feel like I have it all together with this. But what I do know is that there is so much grace for us when we realign ourselves back to the centre, back to our focus and our gaze on the only one who is worthy. There's such grace for us where the Holy Spirit meets us exactly where we're at. So in this place, why don't you just now, if maybe you're responding to one of those areas, just begin to lift your hands or even just as a, a posture of surrender, as humility, just centre yourself before the only one who is worthy. We're going to end shortly, but why, okay, come on right now. Just begin to get strip back the noise and focus on God. Focus on the only one who doesn't waver. Focus on the only one who is faithful for all the trials. Focus on the only one who is constant, who is there, who is present, who is not absent. But He is the truest depiction of a God who sits alongside us because He is Emmanuel, God with us. Center your thoughts, your attention, your focus on Him today.